Hello, Paul. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive right in. This is a super cool topic that I'm excited to dig into more. So first, tell me about your company, Havis North America, and how did you come to be at the helm of it? Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it's a great company. So we're, Havas North America is you know, one of the largest advertising and communication companies and part of the larger Havas group globally, you know, based in Paris. And we're part of Vivendi. And Vivendi is a French company that owns Universal Music Group, which, as you might know, owns 50% of the world's music, and Canal Plus and Studio Canal, which is a movie studio, and, and Gameloft, which is one of the largest mobile gaming companies in the world. So in our organization, you have storytelling and creativity covered across the whole spectrum. So it isn't just about advertising, it's about how can culture and, 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 and creativity be a part of helping brands connect with consumers in more emotional, personal ways. And we think that makes us different, different from the other advertising holding companies that are out there. And North America is an important region for Havas. And Jason Peterson and I are our co-chairs of, of the North American region for our company. And we have some great agencies and we have some amazing people all around the country and in the countries here in Canada and in the US and and couldn't be happier to be here. Sweet. All right. Well, what would you say is the specific problem that you solve for the people you serve? Sure. I, mean, I think there's two people we serve, right? The, the first one is the people that work here and and the others are the people that we um, do business with mm -hmm. every day, our, our clients. And what gets us out of bed in the morning is to really be what we the way we say it is the most meaningful partner to the modern CMO and brands and meaningfulness to us takes shape in a lot of ways but when you look at the challenges that brands and marketers have today it's a very different challenge than maybe we had 10 15 20 years ago but a lot of things stay consistent so meaningfulness to us from a brand perspective is how do we leverage creativity in new ways? How do we tap into culture in really, truly authentic and meaningful ways, which uh, many brands get right and many brands don't get right and, and, their, and their brands are impacted because of that. Of course, we need to drive commerce and building community around brands are really important as well, like social followings and engagement and community. Some brands do that really well. And the last one would be the really powerful experiences for us, really powerful customer experiences. Those are the five things that we focus on. Those are the five things that we do for our customers. And for our employees, we want to have a really amazing place to work. You know, advertising is uh, n not an easy industry to yeah. work in. That's yeah. no secret. And I have a saying, I like, to, I like to say that you have to be a masochist and a speed freak to work on the agency side of the business for any period of time. And so for us, how do you create an environment that people want to come to every day, that they want to be a part of, um, that, that helps them truly understand what's happening in culture by surrounding them in culture, and so they can apply that to um, our client work every day. Got it. Have you found that as you invest more in your team, that they are able to in turn able to do better work on the end like is, is it really just you can't focus on just delivering for your clients without making sure that you invest that same type of energy in your team yeah that that's a great point we have a variety of ways that we do that and some of them take place on a daily and weekly basis and some of them take place on a quarterly and annual basis and we have a couple. I mean, one of the things that we do in all of our offices is have cultural events that allow and, and give our people the chance to experience parts of culture that may have nothing to do with advertising, music, fashion, tattoo art, graffiti art, whatever it might be, that, that shows what's happening in, in popular culture, what's mattering to different segments of, of customers, and that helps really create really interesting ideas for our clients. Um, and, and also, like we have larger things, like a lot of our people, we nominate people to go on what we call learning expeditions globally. So if we're a global company, we have um, offices in 45 different countries, especially when you include Vivendi as a part of that. We have some people who go on what we call a learning expedition that visit different offices around the world, visit Universal Music Group, learn about how record labels work, how musicians get signed, 
learn about how scripts are written for TV shows or for movies. And that's a different access into creativity that, that they can bring every day to building brands. All right, so you've mentioned culture a few times, and I, I want to just, I don't want to take for granted that everyone knows what right. we mean whenever we're saying culture. Um, and so I think some of the, the terminology that a lot of people use now is the cultural zeitgeist. So what exactly is the cultural zeitgeist, and how does it help um, companies deliver remarkable experiences to their customers? I'll give you, I'll use some examples to explain cultural zeitgeist because I think that on the most mac macro level, the cultural zeitgeist that we're feeling now is a tension in our society. And we don't have to debate why that tension exists, but if you just look at what's happening today, whether that's Roseanne or whether that's how Kanye is talking to his customer base or whether you, whether you look at what's happening in the world, there's an inherent tension that's permeating music, it's permeating fashion, and it's permeating how um, how brands are connecting with their buyers in more meaningful ways. And I think when you look at that as sort of the overlay, you can think about how brands are engaging that. So oftentimes people, I, I think, misinterpret culture as fashion, like Yeezys, for example. It's like, we need an idea that includes you know Yeezys, or we need an idea that includes Kendrick, or whatever it might be. But actually, there's a part of culture that is technology movements, for example. So when you when you look at blockchain, I would say probably the majority of people don't really know what, how blockchain is or how it works. But we had just created um, an ad, the first ad in the blockchain for TD Ameritrade, uh, which has TD Ameritrade planting a flag in the blockchain. The ad will be there forever. And it's a, it's a way for a brand like TD Ameritrade, which I think that you would look at as like a sneaker brand or a, or a beverage brand, but they're a financial services brand that wanted to capitalize on culture, but do it in a way that was relevant to their, to their brand. Got it. So can any brand tap into this? Because I know like you just gave a great example of TD Ameritrade, which is a, a financial services um, company. Because I think a lot of P companies will feel like, oh, that's not really us. Like, this is it kind right. of in our lane. We're out, out of our element. Is this something that any brand can do? Right. I, I, think, I think that's why I started with, I think, the definition of what the cultural zeitgeist is. And I, the, the truly thing that matters is what's relevant and, and what's in the personality of that brand. Okay. And I think when you look at a brand like Sprite that we work with, it's easy for them to tap into little Yachty and have little Yachty be in their videos and be in their in their commercials. It's easy for them because it, it works for their brand. But little Yachty probably wouldn't work for TD Ameritrade. Although there might be ways that we could work that out if we were trying to connect with a different customer base. It has to it has to be authentic and meaningful and matter to that brand. And and what's interesting is, is that we often find that the people that are making decisions, whether that's the agencies or whether that's the client side aren't typically tapped into what's happening with their customer base. Okay. okay. And, 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 and it's our job as their creative and cultural partner to help demonstrate to them how tapping into certain veins of culture will drive and grow their business. Do you see that? As in, I've, I've heard this a couple of times, do you, and that's obviously your role as the agency. Do you feel like more companies need to start developing more of a sense and a pulse of what's going on, um, you know, so they don't have to rely necessarily all the time on their third party. It probably makes your job easier as well if they're sort of tuned in as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is the value that we bring as a creative partner to to brands across all categories. For us, Jason and I realized a while ago that in order for us to truly be authentic about what's happening in culture, that for the both of us, we needed to bring talent into our company that are from those veins of culture. Okay. They're not okay. traditional advertising people. And this is a body language shift that I think you have a lot of marketers and brands and agencies that talk about culture, get on stage at the big events and talk about culture. We'll do a PowerPoint presentation, show some videos. But really, at the end of the day, they're not really tapped into what's happening you know, into culture. We recognize that, and we kind of leaned into that and said, you know, we, you know, we're getting a little gray, and like we're not really, you know, <laughs> tapped into what's happening. So we built something called the Annex, and the Annex is 
you know, the original positioning was for millennials by millennials. And, and it was, let's bring in, let's hire people from co- the different parts of culture that have no experience in advertising. They, they're from fashion world. We've hired people from, you know, Virgil Abloh's RSVP gallery here in Chicago. We've hired people from music. We've hired people from other aspects of, of the world that aren't traditional advertising creatives. And you, we've paired them with advertising creatives. So for us, like that's how we've stayed relevant and how we brought that to brands. I think that's the role of, I think it's harder for brands to do that because you can't buy your way into culture. I and mean, if, you, if you think of, if you think of how, you know, they'll remain nameless, <laughs> but if you get some brands that have tried to buy their way into culture recently, it goes horribly wrong because often it's very tone deaf. And to do it the right way can be really scary for brands because it doesn't, they don't, it's not natural or native to them, whatever's happening in culture, for the most part, the people making the decisions. That's the tension, and that's the tension where agencies can help resolve that tension because it's easier for us to do that. Often in Fortune 100 companies, it can be more difficult. Very good. Very good. What is the role of, of events in delivering these types of culturally relevant experiences? Because I hear a lot of great examples of brands that are doing lots of cool things that are tapping into you know what's happening right now, um, but it, are events like the core of how it happens or is it really like a cross-section? I think it's really hard to bring a brand to life in, in a 3D way in advertising. And experiential and events are, we see it, we see it rising. We see it's more important to a brand's business. We see that the brands that are doing it the right way aren't just creating these events for a few hundred people they're using that content and they're using that experience okay. to broadcast to a wider, wider group, right? So we, as we talk about return on that investment, how do we make that experience go beyond the few hundred people that engaged it at that moment, right? So we created something for Pete's Coffee at Coachella called you know, the Ice Sauna, which, is where they could, which was a launch of their ice cold brew, but it was at, it was at Coachella, but it wasn't just for the you know, 1,000 people, how many people engaged the event, they use that in a more mobile way to be a part of, of a wider point of view for the brand. And we, we, see, we see experiences growing. We're investing in experiential. We're investing in experiences. And we do see that as a growing part of the business. Sure. Very sure. good. Now, what are your thoughts on the difference between experiential events that some might say are, these are just PR stunts. <laughs> um, and we don't want to be in the business of doing PR stunts versus uh, brands that want to deliver remarkable experiences and meaningful defining moments for their customers. Is there a distinction between the two? I think that I, 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 I can't think of any examples off the top of my head that would be considered a PR stunt, although I think if done right and, and within the context of the positioning of the brand can provide um, a new perspective on the brand and if, and if it's true to the consumer. so. Um, you know, our, our group in New York, the 88s, had done, uh, you know, an event for Adidas in New York City where they sort of leveraged the, um, you know, the, the guys that sell the, the counterfeit bags out of the black bags on Canal Street, you know, and had launched a sneaker that way for Adidas. And it was an event that happened all around the city. And it was a really interesting event, but it tapped into a truth okay. in culture, which was, you know, counterfeit sneaker culture. It tapped you into the truth in New York City, but when you look at the content that was created as a part of this PR stunt, it really tapped into a truth that existed in the world that that would matter for that particular brand. Got it. Got it. Now, how do you, because I've heard you say this a lot of times, like it's not just about creating the event or the experiential moment, it's bringing it in. So is content a like a critical component to being able to do this and make it more of a surround sound type of approach where you're able to reach as many people as possible. Yeah, I think I think content is is at the, the heart of how our industry is changing, and and creativity itself uh, is coming to life in ways that isn't just around the 30 second spot or isn't just around you know you know having four months to create a TV commercial and everybody goes to LA and has craft services and we shoot a TV spot with a celebrity, and what's shifting is is that you know Jason my partner talks about this all the time is that shot on an iPhone fundamentally changed our industry creatively and 
the brands and the agencies that are tapping into this creator culture is, are the ones that are succeeding. So as we look at our creative mission is to move from creatives to creators, that's Jason's creative mission. So in order to do that, you have to hire people that know how to create a TV spot with this, right? And that's a different, that's a different set of skills. And so how do you have an experience or an event and then create content that's relevant, meaningful, and then can be used across platform to exponentially, you know, drive awareness of what's happening with the brand. Got it. So, I, I, I guess I guess with the addition of content, it sort of transform it transforms what brands are producing away from um, moment in time events where it's like okay, we produce one event a quarter to where right. it's something and it's something that allows them to be engaged and connected all the time or all year. Right, right. We created a, a there's a team that we created in Atlanta for Coke and across 16 different Coca-Cola brands that, that is a content creation team. And this team taps into three things. They tap into what they're planned, what's planned on happening. So like the Super Bowl or the Oscars or the Grammys and we're gonna create content for the brands around those. Um, uh, what, 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 what are what's happening in real time, right? So we're, we're at the Super Bowl, something happens in the game. How can we create content in real time that, that drives the brand's purpose, the drive, brand's drive's mission in, in real time. And, and that type of content creation isn't just about creating a TV commercial, it's about providing your buyer with either entertainment or whether utility regarding your particular product or service. But to do it, you have to change your mindset about what content actually is. It's more disposable. It's not, you can test and learn content. Some of the best brands today are, are developing an idea and they're testing and learning that idea with a $500 piece of content. And that content may catch fire or it may not. And if it catches fire, they'll uplift it and they'll start to invest in it, start to invest in the production. And, and, and again, like everybody's creating content now. Everybody's a photographer, everybody a, everybody's a videographer, everybody has a filter, everybody thinks they're an expert on portraits. And, that, and that's cool, but it, it, also, it also, brands have to tap into that. Now, I love how you're talking about the way the world of advertising and promoting your products is changing, right? Like the the, the marketing, there, there's the core principles of marketing, but the way in which we execute and we show up is just, it's evolving, right. it's evolving rapidly. Um, and I think that's kind of difficult for a lot of brands when they're thinking about trying to deliver the remarkable, they, st get, they still get very stuck up, but we've got to talk about our product. We've got to like focus on our features and our benefits. We've got to right. sell, sell, sell. Now, what is the role of having these types of product, more salesy um, messaging as you're trying to have these types of communications and experiences and tap into the culture? at the same time. Yeah, I think that's the tension. Uh, I think I think that brands, especially publicly traded brands, are under pressure to deliver, you know, sales overnight and brand over time, which is which is a which is a tension not only for us but but for them. And when you look at a brand like, you know, when you look at a brand like Carl's Jr. that we recently started working with, I mean, they they balance it nicely. Like they want to tap into what's happening in culture, but they want to do it in a way that promotes the product in a really interesting way, but it promotes a price point in a really interesting way and drives traffic. And one brand that I'll focus on in the same category, which we don't work on, but I have a lot of respect for, is KFC. And you know, if, if you look at the KFC spots over the last few years, the last couple of years maybe, they've done a really interesting job at at creating what I'd call like some of the most promotional advertising that's on that's in the market. But it, but it entertains you, mm -hmm. it's relevant, it taps into culture by changing out who the colonel is every, every week or two, you know? And so they've, they've, found, they've, they've found a way to be creatively relevant, be true to the brand, and be promotional at the same time. Very good. Very good. Now, go along those same lines as you're trying to find that tension, you know, you hear a lot of uh, marketers, a lot of companies focusing it's purely on ROI numbers. Like, so right. how, how do you measure the ROI of these types of events or should that be a part of the conversation as you're yeah. going through it? Yeah, I think um, I'll start by saying that advertising isn't the fix for everything, <laughs> which, which, which oftentimes companies and brands think that advertising and marketing and events will solve all of their problems. 
there there are there there is there is there is I don't know the little thing of like having a good product to sell and or having a good retail environment for people to be a part of or having a great website that actually works or a great mobile app that that actually works. So ROI for me is is a few things. It isn't just, you know, for every dollar I spend I want three back. It's from where I sit, it's did we change perception? Did we improve um, purchase intent, which as a, as an advertising, as a brander, as a brand marketer, often can be the proxy for all we can do, right? Is <laughs> we don't necessarily control the quality of, of what's in the can, or we don't necessarily control the quality of what happens on the website always. We don't control the retail environment always. So if we can change a, a consumer's perception of the brand and we can measure that through purchase intent or brand perception or you know or or the delta between here's how I felt about the brand after I saw the advertising or engaged the event or experience here's how I felt after after that that to us is the ROI and that's very measurable got it no I hear you I think I think that's a good point because I think sometimes they get so focused on we put this commercial up what happened yeah. to the numbers are yeah. uh, we, we we made this Instagram spot did we right. get in a bunch of new likes right. as a result and you know right. <laughs> that's not yeah. always it that's not always it you got you to worry about the product and the experience too which is which is part of that and and every category every single category is being disrupted everyone and you know every client that we have in some way is under attack whether that's through a startup technology company or whether any every retailer that we work with, whether it's Amazon or a direct to consumer brand, like, you know, from an apparel perspective, whether that's Bombas or Roan or like these direct, you know, stance or these direct to consumer brands, they're all under all being disrupted. So what these smaller brands have the ability to do is be distinctive, memorable, more agile, more flexible. They don't have a huge board they need to get approval from. They don't have Wall Street they need to get approval from. They can move quick, and they can actually build technology on the fly. They act more like a Silicon Valley company than an actual, you know, CPG brand. For sure, for sure. Do you do you see taking this type of approach as a combination of both a short term and a long term strategy? Because I, as I hear you talking about it, it seems like this is part of playing the long game. And the more you engage and you stay relevant with what's happening right now, the better you do at earning the attention that keeps right. people coming back over time. Right, right, and I think that it's, you know, if it's trending, it's too late, which is something we, we talk a lot about, that, it, you know, brands will often try to jump on a trend train, and, you know, you can tell the ones that are a little late, and you can tell the ones that are actually setting the trends, and I, I, I think for us and for our clients, you know, driving innovation is one of the hardest things. Driving innovation and being responsible to the the balance sheet on a day-to-day -day basis is a really hard thing to do. And you have to have a leadership team and, and investors and a board or whomever that might be actually believe in investing in, in a percentage of the revenue or whatever it might be in innovation. And what's interesting is, is like when you look, I, someone said the other day, um, negative cash flow is the new sexy. Like when you look at like the big sexy companies like Netflix and Amazon, like the cash flow negative, it's crazy. And so, but they're cash flow negative because they're invest, they're playing the long game. Like they're investing in their technology, they're investing in their platform, like Netflix, they're investing in their content and they aren't beholden to having a 25% return on a quarterly basis. They will at some point, that'll get called at some point, but it'll, by that time it'll be too late for the category because they'll have owned the category. Right. I think that's a, those are great examples. Um, and it just goes to show you kind of good putting that ROI conversation that we were just having back into context of right. when is the right time to measure. And it might just not be so cut and dry as like you said, oh, if I invest a dollar, I'll get three back. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's um, I think it's I think it's OK to have your your cash cow, like whatever it is that is your core business fund your innovation. And I, I think that the smartest companies do that. I think they, they know what their core is. Um, they'll continue to be excellent, execute policy on that core, but they but they have an eye to the future. So they're either investing in like incubators, or they're in, or they're instead of instead of you know uh, ignoring the competitive set or the little startups in their industry, they buy them or they incubate them or they find a way to have a stake in them so that when the time comes, they can make them part of their business to fund their future. 
Sure. Well, this has been super fun. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you? They want to learn more about the work that you guys are doing and some of the cool things that you've done with some of the brands that you've been working yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. On Havas.com, you can find what we're doing overall. And then all my social channels are at Marabella. All right. And I'll put all that in the show notes so people can find it easily. All right. Well, before we go, any parting words of wisdom for business leaders who want to be culture creators? Um, and sort of lead the way versus follow, just purely following the trends as they're working to create um, remarkable experiences for their customers? One of the things I've heard recently that, I, that resonate with me is disruption is when it's being done to you. Innovation is when you're doing it to a category. And so I think, it's, I think that's what we're trying to live by. Um, so we help us try to have our clients live by. And, you know, I wake up every day to try to learn something new. And, you know, as I've been in the business for almost 25 years, it's, it's how do I learn something new? How do I stay tapped in? How do I find a way to you know bring whatever it is that I learn every day to our people and to our customers? So that would be my advice. I love it. I love it. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you again. Super insightful. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you.